Welcome to the Content Strategy Interviews Podcast. Each week, we talk with accomplished content strategy experts to share their wisdom with our friends in the content community. And now, here's your host, Larry Swanson. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode number 14 of the Content Strategy Interviews Podcast. My guest today is Natasha Banta McDermott. Uh, I've known Natasha for years. We worked at a publishing company back in the mid 90s, and uh, she went from there. We both kind of diverged into the, the the world of the interwebs and uh, and uh, doing content more strategically after we left uh, the book publishing industry. So uh, here's Natasha. I'm gonna just Natasha. Let me just have you tell the folks a little bit about your background uh, and um, and uh, what you're up to today. Sure. Sure. Hello, everybody <laughs> from snowy New York. Um, so, Larry, first of all, thank you so much for having me on. I'm honored and and uh, was delighted to hear from you about about coming on. So that's great, and I'm I'm happy to talk about content strategy. It's been um, an enduring part of my life for God since the early '90s. Um, I got into um, content strategy actually through publishing. So my background in publishing and with sort of, you know, writing and the medium of communication basically is what, what got me in the door. Um, I worked for uh, my first job in, a, you know, sort of officially in content strategy was with Addison, uh, Addison was long and no, that was publishing, um, was with um, Studio Archetype in San Francisco. And this was way back in sort of the Wild West the internet. And um, it was in, I got that job in July of 1997. And was actually hired as a writer in a cont- in the content development department, um, and kind of amazingly, there was a content development department in a web design studio in 1997, which I think was just so magnificently forward thinking, and um, they you know, they really had the vision for sort of what content, the importance of it, mm-hmm. and my boss. Sorry, go ahead. Larry. No, I was gonna because I was gonna say that uh, I was also in San Francisco in that area and, and Clement Mock, the guy who founded Studio Archetype was kind of yeah. a, a, one of those cool guys at the time and was doing my really God. Stuff. Absolutely. And, yeah. And um, so he was, he, he's a designer kind of guy, right? But he saw the need for content and the importance of content. Yes. He, so he actually used to, he was one of the original um, people at Apple and he worked with Steve Jobs. I know very closely. And he was, he was a graphic designer. And um, then he became, I think, wildly successful and was, he's a very, very smart, talented guy. And so he started a company called Clement Mock Designs. Um, And that, I think that started maybe 94, 95. And then business was so good, he decided that he could start an actual agency, a web design agency. And so when he started Studio Archetype, which was maybe officially, maybe two years before I, before I was hired. Um, he hired some, he's very smart, but he also hired a lot of really smart people. And one of the people who he hired was um, my first boss, boss there, Judith, who was a journalist, journalism, um, she was a journalist and she went to journalism school at Berkeley. So she was obviously all about content um, and all about um, communication. And she's the one who built out the department. So he definitely had the vision to know to hire her. Um, I mean, he also had a very active um, president um, who I think did a lot of that sort of initial hiring of all the sort of department heads. So I think just very early on, he always knew how important it was um, and how, and I think now sort of in retrospect, it was actually fairly groundbreaking because I don't know who else was really doing it back then. So that, you know, so I started there um, and I worked there. We got acquired by Sapient um, in 1999, 2000. And then the bubble burst and, <laughs> and everyone, you know, sort of scattered to the wind. But everyone, um, there were a lot of people at that time um, who were, you know, who were sort of like a little, a little band, all of us who worked at, at Studio Archetype. And when we scattered to the wind, we also sort of came back together and really helped each other out. It was a really kind of tremendous sense of, of personal community, but also work community. So when I needed work, it, you know, I really didn't have to look beyond um, you know, beyond the, my friends and contacts that were in my phone and reached out and was able to start a little business with one of my friends. And um, we did a, we had a communication company called Storyhouse Partners. 
And then after that shuttered, um, we, um, the two of us, um, you know, have still remained friends and colleagues, but we decided to continue to, you know, stay in content strategy and continue to work. She freelanced and then I freelanced and I've basically been freelancing. And, and I was, as I was saying earlier, sort of been a, a content strategist, writer slash editor, um, for hire ever since then cool. and have sort of worked with a variety of, of companies and nice. individuals. I want to go back a little bit to studio archetype and mm -hmm. the relationship, like how, cause I think of lorem ipsum, you know, that yeah. dreaded, you know, that like that's yeah, how a yeah. lot of design back in that era, that's how designers thought about a lot of designers thought about content. Absolutely. So it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, a, and that's, that was, um, how, like how embedded were you as a content creator and a content strategist in the design process? Like how did things work back then? So, you know, it's, I, I'm just, I'm so delighted to be talking about this because it's just, it actually, it's, it's such a great, it, the experience was so, it was actually kind of amazing and magical because I think that that, just like anything at the beginning, it's, I don't think it's the same now. Um, and it's, you know, now it's amazing and magical probably in a different way. But back then it really was this constantly getting educated about how to push, how to push the boundaries, how to push the design, how to push sort of our understanding of how do we get, you know, say a website, which is, you know, largely what we did. Um, this was kind of before sort of tablet and phone um, content, which is, a, you know, kind of a similar but different sort of animal. But so, say we're just talking about websites. How do we make this experience what it should be and what it could be? So it was all completely embedded in what does the user need? What does the user need? Not what does the marketing department need? Not what does the president of the company need to say, but what does the user need? Because that's all we really care about. So we were constantly fighting this battle with clients. And it was a lot of marketing people who were in the initial meeting saying, well, but in our mission statement, it says blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you know what? We're going to throw that out. Is that what the user needs? Does the user care about your mission statement? Eh, probably not. Um, we had a client, Pete's Coffee was one of our early clients and they actually have a pretty cool mission and they're, they were a cool brand. And, and so, um, there's a way to sort of say for them, for example, to incorporate the mission kind of into the user experience in a way. But if you're some, a little bit more sort of stodgy company, then something like a mission statement really, you know, needs to kind of not be part of the content or not be part of the experience because people really don't, you know, it's not important to them. So, um, I think content was constantly having to be explained not to our it, like within our working group so i would work typically with um there'd be a um, someone called a creative integrator which was the fancy name for a project manager so i'd have a creative integrator um and then so they'd be running kind of running the show and then you'd have a designer you'd have a content strategist slash writer you'd have a back-end person um, and then you'd have a front back end developer and a front end developer. And so all of us pretty much right from the beginning of the project would be sitting in a room together, which is really kind of amazing that we were doing that because that was not, you know, usually it's like, Oh, slap in the content. Just like you were saying about Lorne Ibsen, you know, when you're done and we kind of, you know, we have to sort of work it around this design box or whatever. Um, but the group at Studio Archetype really always believed in content. The tricky thing is outside of our walls, we had to convince clients to want to pay for it that early on. So that was, I, I think that was sort of the nut of the struggle. And it wasn't really a massive struggle with most people. With some people, we really had to um, give them solid reasons why they should be paying for it. And you'll see, you know, and we kept have, you know, having to, you know, I've done a million what I would call the roadshow. And so basically I'd get up and it was, you know, sort of dog and pony. I'd go to various clients um, and I'd have, you know, my PowerPoint presentation and examples and talk about good content, bad content, good content starts early, bad content starts late. You know, it was really sort of basic. It was almost, I mean, it was teaching essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and that a lot of times had to get done. Um, you know, for me as a content strategist and us as a content strategy group and a content development group with before a client would even hire us right. because we had to sort of prove the worth of it. And it pretty much worked most of the time because it's, let's be honest, as content strategists, we all know we need it and we all know it's important. So once you kind of make your points and you present the evidence, it became clear.
Right. Well, that's so interesting because you guys were fighting the battle 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's still being fought and you were doing it successfully. <laughs> that's that's uh, kudos to you for that. But also there's um, <clears throat> those dyna and a lot of the stuff you just talked about. It, it reminds me of, like you, the, this focus on the users. Yeah. Like, that was that was a thing. I remember back in that era hearing that a lot and there was a lot of lip service paid to it, but you guys were actually delivering it. It sounds like, and, um, yes. you know, pushing back on clients who, <clears throat> who had, I guess they were, you're kind of fighting their uh, conventional ideas about what a media person would do for them. And you're Absolutely. like, no, it's not flashy design. You need content under there as well. Right. Right. Yeah, interesting. Right. Absolutely. And you know, something that actually, um, really helped is we did, user testing and we would do super basic like paper prototypes. We would put an ad out in Craigslist, you know, 50 bucks, come in for an hour. We're going to walk you through, you know, a prototype of, we wouldn't tell them what the, what the experience or what the, you know, sort of who the client was, but we'd, we'd just make these. I mean, I think I hand sketched a bunch of them and believe I'm definitely not a designer, but it was so basic that even I could do it. <laughs> and you'd sit with, you know, you'd sit with someone in the room and say, okay, you want to buy this, watch or you know whatever you want to um you know order these you know this coffee you know whatever whatever it was take them through the experience and we would put in dummy content now not like the perfectly crafted stuff but content that that actually aided the experience and gave you the experience and that's also how we sort of vetted um um, content strategy in a way, you know, like that actually also then proved to the client, see, if you didn't have content that was informative, that was useful, that was on target, this process that this person's going to with this paper prototype wouldn't work. They wouldn't know what to do or where to go. And so if you have like stuff that spins and stuff that looks pretty, that's, I mean, stuff that spins is never good, but stuff that looks pretty, but if it's not completely integrated and not just supported by but integrated with actual usable content that's smart that's informative that's on brand that's on target and is completely um supporting the experience you're kind of sunk mm -hmm. so those those kind of early user testing things also i think because the client often would come in and sit like you know it was behind the one-way glass kind of thing um and they would really see that 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 was happening and that was that was successful for us so that was kind of like that was almost like a tactic in some ways well that's interesting but that and that testing was kind of proving your hypothesis that these integrated teams what did you call it creative integrator that was a, a creative role integrator was the name of the project i, yeah. I love that role name because <laughs> I, I was know. just talking i was talking recently with uh you know Rand fishkin the seo guru oh yeah he's sure. here in seattle and he, i was i interviewed him and he talked to i asked him at one point what the his dream um team would be for any for any kind of project you know especially an seo content seo oriented content strategy team <clears throat> but he described a team pretty much exactly like you were doing hmm. back then you know you'd want your uh you know some kind of a direct you know manager person but yep. a content person a coder um a client person maybe you know that that whole that kind of team you were talking about um yeah and the other so there's that that sort of team and then you 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 prove it with the testing yeah um how how about results that you could you that's the ultimate test for the clients were they ultimately delighted with what you guys were up to they i mean studio archetype did phenomenally well like we we actually were at the point where we really got to pick and choose i mean we weren't you know you know obviously you know we need to keep the doors open and all that stuff but there were sometimes you know, certainly in, in the years before the bubble burst where we actually could pick and choose clients in a way that I couldn't believe, you know, at the beginning, when I first got there, we were out, you know, I would go on pitches and we were really just like pushing, 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 really trying to get as much business through the doors. And then we did phenomenally well. And I think that that was in large part due to the fact that I think clients really saw us as being very smart about what we were selling. And we also, I don't think sold, you know, stuff that people didn't need. I think that we also felt like clients are also smart and um, they may not know exactly what they need, but they kind of know what they don't need. So let's not try to sell them, you know, a bag of hammers when they don't need that kind of thing. I have no idea if that's an actual metaphor. I just don't right. make that up. <laughs> um, but um, so I think that they were very happy largely because I felt like also we were very honest. And I think part of the pushing back 
um, and so, you know, my experience with that in content is I think clients actually at the end of the day really like that because they feel like you care and you're thinking about their situation and their particular problem, whatever problem it is they're trying to solve, whatever website they're trying to put up, whatever obstacles they're against. If you push back and ask questions and present solutions in ways that they didn't think of, I think that there's a tremendous amount of respect there. And I think the student archetype was very highly respected and God, I mean, we worked our butts off and we really felt like, um, we always wanted to give them the very, very best that we possibly could. And we wanted them to feel like um, the things that we recommended to them were going to work for them and that they were, and that they were, you know, that we really felt very strongly about them. And um, I think we constantly were sort of reworking. There were no, there were no patterns then 20 years ago, really. Like we were kind of inventing a lot of stuff not really on the fly because we would never present it on the fly to the client, but sort of like there was a lot of scrambling, you know, midnight before something's due kind of thing because stuff hadn't really been done before. So it really was, it really was exciting and kind of scary. Um, but I think that clients by and large were very, very happy with our work and we get a lot of follow on work. We get a lot of, um, you know, okay, you're doing this for, this for us now. Okay, now in six months, we want to roll out this. And we did a lot of that too. And actually content, interestingly, and at content still works this way, but back then too, where you don't have to give them the whole enchilada immediately. Um, and just because something is, is presented and is on the website, you know, we can change it anytime we want. We can, have a, we can have a schedule where stuff gets populated. You know, we, had a, we actually also had a content manager which was phenomenal. And this was this great woman named Linda and she would sit and she um, developed content management systems and she was a, a complete whiz kid and we could sell, Hey, you know, you are essentially a publisher and you're creating, you know, we're creating this website for you. You guys can now, once we turn this over to you, you guys can run it. And this is what we recommend is a schedule for when your headline needs to change, for when your body copy needs to change, when the stuff in, you know, that's happening in your back end, that can all feed into the content management system. And clients were like, oh my God, this is amazing. You've turned us into publishers mm -hmm. um, and we can do it ourselves and then we don't have to keep paying you. So, you know, they were happy about, they were happy about that right. too. Well, that's interesting because you and I, <clears throat> we both got our start in publishing and then, yeah. And then, uh, and that's always, I've always felt like that's, you know, one of the big things we could bring to this, this crazy new venture of interactive publishing and digital media was the, the, just the idea of having procedures and having style guides and things like yeah. that, that just come naturally to us that are still like to some people like, Oh, that's a good idea. You know, that, um, uh, so, and so when you say that, like you're turning them into, pub when I always think of when you're your own publisher now, I think of content marketing. You know that, like. Yeah. Let me let me ask you about the kind of content you're doing because there's sort of like the copy, you know, ad promotional persuasive copy, and then there's the uh -huh. authoritative, like we know what we're talking about. You should trust us, kind of copy. Right. How did that break down in the stuff you were working on back then? Was there? There wasn't. Uh, that's an interesting question. I, I think. I think that. Back then, there was not, there was, there well, the, I think the savviness about how to market on the web was not what it is now. I think it was much more, I want to say rudimentary. I don't really mean that. I mean, it was just, I guess it was just kind of, it was just in a much more sort of in its infancy. And so it was very clunky and it seemed really obvious. Like I'm really being marketed to. Um, and I think that us as writers and content strategists would say, you can't really do that. I know that you want to say that, and those are your marketing messages, and that's what sort of your mandate is. But, uh, you, you, you know, and this, this, was a lot, this was a lot of the pushback on clients was just getting that content, getting that marketing stuff off, and, but not having the, the sort of wonky information or the stuff that you really need, not having that be boring or it always has to be leading you somewhere. You don't want someone, I mean, unless it's like a white paper about, you know, something. And if it was, you know, like a medical journal or whatever, obviously that kind of content is totally different. But the stuff that we really did was really a lot of sort of B to C stuff. And so, you know, as the consumer, you want to get where you're going as quickly as you can. So all of our content, the design, the whole experience was to get you from A to B 
as quickly as you could with all the information that you needed to make informed decisions. So well, that, that was makes, sort of, That's yeah. really interesting to me because I, do you, I, I don't know when the phrase customer journey was coined, but do you know that? <laughs> that's what they yeah. talk about that a lot in, in use at UX and now there's a whole field of customer experience, CX. Yes. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you, that's what you're describing right there. And you were doing Absolutely. The, uh, what did you call it? <laughs> you just, we, it, but we, again, we, it goes back to that user focus, right? Is that yes. Yeah. Yes. And it was all about, it, you know, every single meeting, it's like, it's, it was always, what does a user need? So we used to, call, when we just, we called it UX. So we never said customer journey, but you're right. That's exactly is absolutely what it is. But I think in some ways, the customer journey is a little different than the phrase user experience. It, I think in some ways it actually, I think user experience sounds more what it actually is. Customer journey sounds, I don't know, it's a little too fluffy for me. Like, it, like they could be on any kind of journey. They could, you know, it's what's, what's the journey? It's just, we, we had a very specific idea of what the user experience was, and it was as sort of pared down and as efficient and as effective as it could be without being boring and without leaving stuff out. And we had a team of designers, a studio archetype that were unbelievable. You know, the, you know, they would sketch in their, in the, you know, and do portraits and stuff in their spare time. And like, I mean, real artists. So the stuff that they brought to bear for these websites was beautiful. Just mm -hmm. so the experience, while it was, we tried to keep it kind of spare and lean and user focused, was always beautiful. So I think that was a major selling point. Was like the stuff was really good, like, and it was gorgeous, and it got you where you wanted to go. So it was sort of like the perfect thing. Yeah, and I don't know. I, I remember that era of the web, and there was not a lot of pretty stuff on the web back then. No, there was, no, there there really wasn't. Uh, yeah, and you you guys were taking it up like two or three notches. Um, yeah, and I think maybe you know Clement came from you know he was a designer, you know. I'm sorry, had, you know, and, and so many people had. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, can you say that again? We, uh -oh. we just had a little internet can glitch you, there, but um, I can hear you fine now. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I got you too. Clement had um, come I said from, that, yeah, I was just saying that he was a, you know, he's a designer. So he comes from sort of an, you know, an artistic and art focused background. And a lot of the people who were there as designers of Studio Archetype in the early days also came from sort of art backgrounds. A lot of them went to art college. So this was also a group of people who were, I mean, I was in my mid twenties and all of us were basically some, you know, within a seven year range of each other. So it all kind of gone to college sort of around the same time. And this was, all, you know, most of our first jobs on the web. So that in some ways made it special and made it, I think there were, that was sort of like a glue that held us together because we had this sort of similarity. I mean, I didn't go to art college, but we had a similarity of experience in that, you know, we all kind of grew up, you know, sort of seventies, eighties, um, and had sort of had these sort of cultural experiences that were sort of at the same time. And I think that really, that really helped certainly in the early, in the early days, because no one, you know, really, it hadn't really been done before. So kind of coming from, coming from a kind of a, a, a same sort of era was helpful. And I don't think it, I don't think that ever necessarily needs to happen, but it was sort of like a, it was one of those things where, um, just the, that, like the stars sort of aligned, I think. Mm -hmm. What's well, it, you know, so much of what you've talked about is like, really, it seems almost prescient, you know, that, that it, that you've figured mm -hmm. out a lot of stuff that people are figuring out now. I'm really curious about how those super artsy designer types and yeah. the, the, uh, the intellectual writer types, yeah. like how, how, how the two of you came together, like what, because you, you, you figured out so much back then. I know people are still, uh, you know, teams, Team building is always interesting. Yeah. Uh, and um, how did you, did, were there any conflicts or not, not even conflicts, but just sort yeah. of stylistic differences? Like how did you um, uh, unite the design and the writing worlds? I think, uh, I mean, I guess everything, oh, you know, the fact that we were a web design company, the fact that design is actually, you know, essentially in our, it wasn't our tagline, but that's, that was the industry that we were in. And, and I would always say, I work for Studio Archetype, it's a web design company. You know, I wouldn't say it's a content creation company, but it was, but that's not, you know, that's not what, that's not how we talked about it. And that's, 
Um, so I think that the designers were definitely sort of like the first, sort of the first line. So you always wanted, um, you know, if you didn't have a good designer, your project wasn't going to go anywhere. Um, and, you know, I guess the, the same would be if you didn't have a good content person too. So I think, I think there was a little bit of a shift where designers, I think, thought, and this is sort of not, and not even, this is not knocking them at all. I think they definitely thought that they were sort of the key. And I think that they were, but they were, I think there was more than one key. I think, in, I think everybody sort of was a key. And I think it, it ended up being the creative integrator's job to make sure that every, everybody felt sort of as equal and as valued. And it didn't really take much because, I mean, honestly, there was not a lot of ego. There was just not a lot of, oh, I'm a designer, so I'm more important than you or better than you. Or it just, it was, it was um, I think it, it really felt very equal. And, you know, you obviously, the, the whole, you know, there's different personalities and, you know, that aside, that would happen obviously in anything. But it really, I, I personally did not experience a lot of sort of inter-department inter or inter-role um, conflict. Mm -hmm. um, also, I think part of it is that we made fun of each other a lot. So there was a lot of humor. So, you know, you can take to some da someone down a notch if you tease them about something or whatever. <laughs> so, that, so that kind of like is a great, humor is the great leveler and we laughed a lot. And so that definitely really helped. Right. I think nowadays there's so much attention to Cult, you know, work culture and, and yeah. how places are up. There's also more attention now, though, to diversity and inclusion. Yes. And you mentioned there was sort of like not a homogeneity, but like a commonality in the, in the group that you were working to, together with. Have you subsequently done any work in more diverse settings, like where you had generational clashes or, you know, like other kinds of, yeah? You know, absolutely, absolutely. So that was, I think, my only experience where it was as sort of homogenous, I think homogenous from, a, um, we were, were actually sort of culturally and background wise, it actually was pretty diverse. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it was homogenous in that we were all really around the same age. It was definitely more, that I think was the sort of the kind of the homogenous part of it. And that was the last time that ever happened. So every place I've worked subsequently has been a huge range of ages and and, and the great thing about that is that everyone brings so much experience and different experience, and that can only help. And so I think that that, I don't, I mean, I guess that was maybe something that was missing from Studio Archetype in the early years, but we literally didn't really have it because no, there was nobody who had done it before us. Right. So I think, you know, practically speaking, that, that wasn't something that we could have changed in any way. Um, so now 20 years down the road, you'd have people who, you know, who've been in, who've been in it for a really long time. And then I'll work for like when I was working for Razorfish there, you know, people who are 25 and 26. And literally I find myself going in my head, I remember when, you know, and you're just like, oh my God, I'm so old. <laughs> um, but it's great. Yeah. But it's great. Um, and I think it's also necessary. And I think that that is very much that just makes anything and everything better. More experience is always better. Yeah. So it's almost like you need a cultural integrator as well as a creative integrator. Right, that's right. Uh, you that's know, right. That, 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 that ideal team lead would encompass both of those. That's right. Um, yeah, I just I can't believe we're coming up on a half hour already, and I like oh to keep God. these up those. But hey, one th But before we wrap it up, I want to ask you just uh, uh, anything last. You know, like, like while you have the ear of my audience, is there anything about content strategy about you know, like your kind of your career path or people getting into the field or wisdom from a veteran? Um, any last thing you'd like to share with my folks? Sure. Um, I guess I feel that, and 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 my, you know career has sort of has really displayed this that content strategy is basically in everything and I think that you can can take that experience and that skill and you can put it into any industry and basically any almost anything that someone is creating will take content and will take a strategic view of content um, and content I think used to be thought of um, in some ways as sort of long and rambling and like, oh, page scrolling. And, and I think people who don't understand content think that. And um, hopefully that's changing. But content is, is everywhere. And I think 
having, having a strong sense of what's needed, where it should go, what it should say and how it should say it. If you just think about those like five big or four big questions, what that's everything. That's if you're writing, you know, if you're, if you're creating, um, you know, up the back of a cereal box or you're selling shoes or you're, you know, like it, it is, it's everywhere because it's about what is your, what are you trying to accomplish? And that is always done in some shape or form with words generally. Perfect. Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah. That's a, that's a perfect so. ending. Yeah. I like, um, I, I, we, we talked a little bit before we got on the air about, uh, my thoughts about content strategy that like it's uh, you can be strategic about content anywhere. And that's yes. what you just said. And you should be strategic about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think that um, I think it helps at the beginning or if you say, if you're trying, if you're sort of looking for, for work as a content strategist and you're trying to sell yourself to just talk about how the experience of how you move through any process you as a content strategist have value, a tremendous amount of value in that process. Um, so I think that, I think just to sort of, for your listeners to just keep in mind that, that as a content strategist, your value is, is massive and everywhere. Um, and if, and I think that we kind of take it for granted um, in some ways as content strategists, because, but if someone who isn't one, and if they were actually to sort of pick apart all the things that are like in our houses or out, you know, anything that we interact with, it's all about content. Yep. So like it. that wasn't super pithy, but <laughs> no, <laughs> well, the last thing it's all. all about content. Yeah. <laughs> That's what this show is. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Natasha. It's great catching oh, up. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you for listening. Tune in next week for another content strategy interview.